it's a, a great pleasure back here again. Uh, for those who were in the morning, it's uh, really a couple of hours, but um, um, for others, maybe a little uh, longer. Now I'll try to uh, do something with Eurasia, a uh, geopolitical question that I am working on, uh, and um, uh, so it is going to be a little different from uh, by continuous discussion uh, over time, uh, like uh, the terrible Turk in Europe, uh, the image, uh, the formation of the Ottoman Empire, and so on. Um, uh, this is something that I am uh, still there are knotty areas trying to resolve. So um, I will have to look at my notes, which will be uh, uh, a, a little interruption because I cannot see very well still uh, uh, after my eye operation. So I might have to you know, look at my notes uh, from time to time. Uh, now. We're talking about Eurasia, which is a difficult and an elusive concept. Uh, we basically might say Eurasia, you know, it's Europe plus Asia. So uh, Eurasia, what is uh, so difficult about that concept? Uh, that is uh, the question uh, that got me interested in this in the first place. You ask about Eurasian problems, and you get uh, your answers depending on uh, the uh, person. You get your answers pointing to different con uh, contexts in, uh, in, in uh, this landmass, uh, but they clearly mean that uh, their concept of Eurasia does not encompass the entire thing. So, um, what is this Eurasia, is uh, the, the first uh, question that got me interested in uh, this. Why do we have uh, this uh, notion of uh, Eurasia? This differs uh, from uh, uh, where you look. Uh, it looks different. Second uh, question that uh, got me really uh, interested in this is that over the, the last uh, several years, uh, from the Policy Center think tank uh, at Savanja University and our uh, cooperation uh, with the uh, German Marshall Fund, Transatlantic Academy, um, uh, um, Dege uh, Ape, Berlin. Uh, the more questions I asked, uh, the, the, the more interesting answers I got. But it was uh, uh, people had uh, different ideas about uh, what this uh, Eurasia was. In fact, the the more involved I got into this, uh, the more I remembered um, this uh, French uh, post-structuralism. Uh, and French uh, linguistics, uh, <coughs> the, um, uh, uh, the the uh, shifters, the idea of shifters, like uh, uh, have uh, uh, I or pronouns are shifters in the sense that uh, when I say I, uh, I point to myself, and when you say I, you point to yourself. So it doesn't have a particular referent, and so on. And it seemed to me this elusiveness of uh, Eurasia was something like this. Uh, and the, and the sec uh, second uh, issue, therefore, uh, is how much do we know uh, about Eurasia, particularly uh, with uh, my uh, work uh, on the uh, future of the liberal order, until we realized that the liberal order was uh, its future depended not on the West anymore with um, uh, American isolationism, 
and uh, English Brexit, that um, the uh, great locomotive uh, for <coughs> international trade was going to come from uh, there, which essentially uh, is not a locomotive for liberal order, but only a fraction of the liberal order. Uh, as, uh, uh, trade. So, uh, what do we uh, mean? Uh, how much do we know about this area? And pretty soon, uh, I started formulating the question slightly uh, in a more relevant and practical fashion, that our notion of Eurasia uh, in uh, the West, particularly, um, is uh, connected very much with post-Second World War international arrangements. In other words, we have an Atlanticist view from Western Europe or from, from Washington, uh, from East Coast United States, that we look at Europe, and there is Europe, we understand, and then there is uh, what used to be the Iron Curtain, and things start getting uh, blurry, and then there is Moscow, and we can't get beyond that. So actually, we're completely ignorant about what happens here. Uh, from uh, the same could be said, I think, of the, uh, the Pacific perspective, that again, the Pacific after uh, the Second World War really became uh, the, uh, the responsibility, uh, not even of the State Department, not even big policymakers in Washington, but it is, was responsibility, essentially, of the Pacific commander of the <coughs> US Navy. Uh, so, from that perspective, you, uh, things started gelling. You have uh, Japan here, and then beyond Japan, there is a sparsely populated extension of the Soviet Union, but you have your belt of containment right here that last weekend may be getting relaxed. I do not know, but it is very after the Korean War, this was, uh, that border was set. And then after 51, the communist takeover of China, you have essentially your alliance here down to the Philippines and then uh, Australia, New Zealand and um, this, this area and uh, uh, apart from um, uh, apart from the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, nationalist Chinese government there uh, you have uh, 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 China that is equally closed and mysterious. Uh, so we didn't know anything beyond. Um, now, this uh, level of ignorance is uh, uh, not acceptable to understand what is happening uh, with the geopolitics of uh, this entire uh, continent. Is it an entire continent is uh, another uh, question that uh, may be able to uh, ask. Um, because this is very clearly Asia and uh, this is very clearly Europe. Um, to the geographers. But when you talk about Eurasia, it becomes uh, blurred. Why? Because actually, uh, how uh, did Europe get defined? And uh, there is a uh, wonderful response uh, to that question that what defined your Europe 
in uh, historic times uh, from uh, 5th to 15th century where the waves of immigration, waves of Tartar invasions, uh, before that Germanic invasions, but certainly a population and military push that ultimately shaped the uh, Holy Roman Empire, the uh, settlement of the uh, Germanic groups, and ultimately, if you're defining something, uh, you're defining that in contradistinction to something else. Now, we do not have this problem with any other continent uh, because there are actually natural borders de defining and, and dividing other continents. Uh, and for, for modern times, the definition uh, of Africa even was uh, the Suez Canal. Uh, but even before the Suez Canal, there's a very small uh, piece of land, a bridge there. There is no uh, geographic uh, barrier uh, here that actually divides uh, Europe uh, from Asia. In fact, if we look at uh, uh, the current and uh, historic treatments of um, uh, the situation, uh, let me give uh, one current uh, treatment. We look at basically uh, the question of what belongs to Europe and what doesn't, and I'm not talking about EU, I'm talking geographically right now, but um, uh, the, uh, if we are going to take this Ural Mountains as the essential border, first of all, there is no border here, it's open. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, this is uh, right here, is uh, Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan is clearly in Europe. Uh, then what divides Europe are the Caucasus Mountains, Turkey is clearly not in Europe, except a small part of it, but much more to the east. Kazakhstan is a part of Europe, where Kyrgyzstan uh, isn't. Well, I mean, that is not how our, our mind works. That is not how the economic and political dynamics work. That is not uh, reflective of the uh, affinity of the peoples or the language uh, uh, groups uh, that, uh, that uh, are um, uh, there at the at the moment. Um, with this question, I uh, had a um, a uh, small uh, brainstorming seminar uh, with. Uh, geostrategic thinkers and uh, uh, some leading people, uh, including China, Russia, uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, from Washington, uh, and European think tanks um, about uh, uh, maybe less than two dozen of us uh, looking at this question. Um, and, and we started with this uh, question, what is uh, Eurasia? Uh, now, um, we, uh, we found out pretty soon that in the discussion among experts, the term Eurasia was often used as a pseudonym, shorthand, for uh, Central Asia and Caucasus. So when I asked for uh, talk about Eurasia, uh, people were referring uh, to what was happening here and here at the moment. Uh, that is, of course, understandable because they would then refer to 
the geopolitical realities here in terms of Russia, uh, all the way here, and the influences and geopolitical realities here in terms of China. So their idea of Eurasia was what was left uh, 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 between uh, Russia and uh, China. One expert uh, uh, cited, actually, I'm reading uh, from here, that um, uh, there are clear borders uh, for Europe that has 44 sovereign states. Uh, ASEAN uh, in, the, uh, in, in China, uh, Southeast Asia, 10 states. South Asia, 8 states. Uh, regional groupings of post-Soviet countries, as well as the Middle East, in these two areas, the Middle East and the former uh, part of the Russian uh, fe uh, Federation, uh, Soviet uh, Central Asia, there are no clear borders. So, in fact, uh, to Put the Middle East aside, which has other uh, questions associated with it. What we are really uh, talking about is the mysterious part for us, which is undefined part for us, is the Central Asia, is Central Asia, about which we uh, know very little. What are the similarities uh, uh, and differences uh, between these countries? Central Asia uh, is one of the most uncertain and fluid regions uh, anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. The region is not in good shape economically, uh, and as the regional economy is not diversified and is totally dependent uh, economically on uh, others, well, others really mean China and Russia. The economic challenge has become increasingly evident uh, against the stagnating oil prices. Now, uh, uh, there, uh, in parentheses, why do I bring all of a sudden oil prices? Let me uh, say something that oil prices are uh, an essential uh, important uh, independent variable that affects Russia's relationship with Central Asia in the following way. Um, Russia, uh, mind you, is one of the, uh, uh, well, in fact, is the world's uh, largest exporter of gas. Uh, it, is, uh, it has the world's largest uh, reserves of gas and it has uh, the largest exporter of gas. Now, uh, that means, uh, and this is constantly in the news, uh, uh, that uh, Russian uh, do the domination of Russian supplies in the um, uh, European gas market is uh, related to Europe's energy security, a point that Washington uh, constantly makes. But the issue about Central Asia is that the Russia has had an imperfect and not uh, uh, not a uh, successful transition from being a communist country uh, where it has failed as a communist country because it was not uh, managed, the economy was not managed uh, properly and it could not have been managed properly if you distribute your resources uh, to your population until you run into uh, problems of uh, uh, foreign exchange uh, and economic resources and so on. After the demise of the Soviet Union, what happened was that Russia 
became a separate actor, but had actually in the uh, east, uh, in this area, let me see whether we have, uh, oh, no, well, these are all earlier than, um, uh, the, essentially, uh, you know, using the resources of this uh, Central Asia and bringing uh, those into a central uh, system and the exports to Europe, the profits from exports to Europe, were used for a, quite a long time after the fall of the Iron Curtain to subsidize uh, distribution of natural resources within. In other words, you have, uh, you charge the uh, Russian uh, citizen using gas at the lowest rate in Moscow, and then you have a slightly higher rate for the Ukrainians, but the Ukrainians are still your immediate neighbors, and then you deliver gas to, uh, at the German border via uh, Belarus or Ukraine at a much higher rate. What you get from Germany pays for the reduction, reduced uh, price of uh, what you sell your immediate neighbors, and then then came changed uh, our geopolitics as well. Came the subprime crisis of 2007, followed by the uh, euro crisis. Well, demand fell, there's, there's a crisis, demand falls, and uh, if the general demand falls, then uh, uh, energy demand falls, and that creates a downward pressure on prices. Well, gas prices delivered by uh, pipeline uh, are indexed to gas prices, uh, by our index to oil prices, largely because of the Russians, they wanted to uh, index it to something. The oil prices fell also. Uh, there were other factors. Uh, even today, Russia's 50% of federal Russia's uh, budget is dependent on oil and gas exports. So it is a huge income for Russia. The downward pressure of uh, oil prices made uh, it difficult for Russians. Uh, once they made it difficult for Russians, they basically told uh, a, an important uh, supplier to the Russian system, Turkmenistan, in uh, 2009, uh, they said, well, we're not going to buy any more gas from you. Uh, Turkmenistan said, but we have a long-term contract with you. Of course, they were paying Turkmenistan something like at that time, uh, $150 uh, uh, dollars, uh, per unit uh, for gas that they would charge at the German border, $412. Uh, that was the kind of discrepancy. Um, it is much less now because the prices have come down. And uh, Turkmenistan said, no, you can't do that. And Moscow basically said, we can't do that. We'll show you how we can do that. And one, um, at the end of the year, uh, they, without letting the Turkmen know that there were uh, going to shut the valve, uh, valve off uh, to stop the flow of gas. Uh, they did so. And uh, the gas uh, pressure built up, uh, the pipeline exploded, and Moscow said, well, this is what happens when you don't listen to us. Now, I told you the story uh, to, again, uh, say something about the current geopolitical arrangements of the region that uh, essentially 
there is a kind of interdependency here that uh, Moscow is the guarantee of stability and essentially uh, the vehicle by which these countries, these landlocked countries, can reach the global markets and um, uh, at the same time, of course, Russian domination of these Central Asian uh, markets are uh, still there, Central Asian countries. Uh, this is one aspect that when you say Eurasia, if you look at the uh, area you are least familiar with, and that area seems to be an area of chaos. Why chaos is another um, uh, question that I will briefly uh, touch upon, not, uh, but it basically says something uh, about uh, Russian priorities and Russian culture of leadership uh, that in fact unites Russia's political culture in such a way that uh, explains why Mr. Putin is so popular in uh, Russia. Uh, of course we attribute that to the fact that uh, after the demise of the Soviet Union, the uh, uh, Russia uh, went through such a bad period in terms of economics, in terms of international prestige, in, in terms of uh, not being able to manage its own sovereign bureau, exert its own sovereignty, and the whole Yeltsin era of uh, uh, lack of leadership. And I remember one case where Yeltsin was unable to climb down the stairs of a plane uh, because of drunkenness to say hello to Icelandic Prime Minister and so on. And then Mr. Putin came and uh, started uh, giving Russia a, uh, a respectability uh, in the eyes of his own constituency. Respectability means that if you say something, you have some sort of a uh, uh, force uh, to back that up. Which brings me <coughs> to this essential distinction that um, uh, Bruno Matzais uh, talks about in his recent book about Eurasia. Uh, a, uh, a wonderful treatment that is making a comparison between uh, the European concept of rule of law uh, that essentially you set up institutions and you have uh, respect for these institutions and you have to take uh, the institutional setup, including the, uh, the uh, rule of law, uh, very, very seriously. That, Matzai's clearly uh, discusses in his treatment uh, in the cultural, political cultural context of that, is not the way Russian political culture works. Uh, that's the Russian political culture is essentially a projection of power rather than looking at the restrictions or the system of laws and institutions and processes. That is not very important uh, in the eyes of the Russian constituency. 
So in fact, uh, something like chaos, managing chaos is a means to project or leverage your power, but chaos is also a way of uh, putting a cordon sanitaire where particularly where you want uh, non-intervention. And that cordon sanitaire is also used with regard to ERQs, and uh, which I think fi I find an impressive argument, but uh, I have uh, not 100% decided on it, but it's a very intriguing argument, that of course, uh, EU, uh, Europe, essentially, I'm, I'm slightly different from uh, the way US uh, looks at these things, but Europe basically does not like to get involved in chaos. It doesn't. I mean, for years, uh, there was a discussion of whether Turkey is, should be a member of the EU or not. Uh, this was a while back. Uh, but uh, uh, I remember talking to a lot of German politicians at that time in the, uh, in the, in the 90s and so on. They would say, look, I mean, Turkey is very near the Middle East. And by bringing Turkey in, we'll have Middle East coming in. And Middle East came in some other ways into Germany. Now that's not an argument anymore, but it's a, it's a clear illustration that you don't want the mess of uh, getting entangled uh, within the European Union in the mess of the Middle East. The same thing is true, or uh, similar thing is true about Ukraine. You do not want to get so much, see what happened. I mean, Russia essentially, uh, by creating a chaos in Ukraine, um, sort of fed it off greater European involvement. I'm not talking about assistance planning and so on and so forth. Involvement, I mean, there are very few people now after this uh, situation in the Ukraine um, uh, to, uh, consider Ukraine a uh, future member of the uh, one exception, of course, that is uh, Hungary and Poland. They have their own interest in that. Well, so, uh, so to not to repeat this morning, I'm going to uh, switch now to the uh, to another aspect of this. We have. Um, a situation of Russia and Russia's backyard, which to us uh, seems to be a threat, uh, a festering threat, but from the Russian viewpoint, to have a bit of a chaos there is not the attitude from Moscow to Kinesk attitude is not the same as we would have uh, in, uh, we would uh, view uh, if the, uh, I mean, I, our reaction to the Balkans were uh, to settle that uh, Balkan uh, conflict, but this seems to be continuing here with uh, uh, varied uh, and, and uh, articulated Russian responses. From there, uh, once we bring in China, and I would like to bring China in there, uh, and then um, come to this, uh, the broader geopolitical picture of uh, what is happening, this uh, whole pivot east. Uh, uh, now, China is uh, doing something completely different. Uh, now, what China is doing, uh, uh, look at China. China is uh, exerting uh, an 
increasingly uh, larger um, uh, influence in a larger area and is doing this faster and faster. It has both the uh, uh, the uh, means in terms of uh, human power and in terms of resources and money to uh, be able to do that. But what is China exactly doing? China's number one priority before, let's say there is China before 2010 and China after 2010. I use this as a uh, point. It is somewhere in, I think, mid or early spring of 2010 that China's energy consumption caught up and surpassed that of the United States. That is a very good date to remember that China, any country, uh, can uh, consume more energy than the United States. That meant that China had to guarantee its transformation into an increasingly middle class uh, uh, population with increasingly sophisticated production and service industries kicking its uh, dirty industries to poorer areas. And yeah, I mean, you know, steel went from the Ruhr to Korea <coughs> to China, and now it's in India, no? uh, uh, essentially. Uh, before 2010, China had completed something else. China, except for the United States, China essentially has investments, significant or majority investments, all over the globe, except the United States, in energy production, oil and gas, in all these small places in Africa as well. Why would China do that? That is one way of be becoming a global actor. Well, what would a small amount of gas or oil from one of these uh, fragmented small African states, I mean, China doesn't need that. It's nothing for China. Why would China do that? Well, of course, it is presence, but no one else can afford to do it. China can. Um, and by which I mean the following. You have oil majors, you have VPs, Total, whatever, to go into a small market in Central Africa. It's no one knows. You have to put an executive there. You have to have your accountants. You, have, you, you either go to jail for bribing uh, or you cannot bribe, you get nowhere. Uh, the cost of doing business for oil majors in very small areas that, are, that, are, that do not have clear laws and so on is impossibly high. China is the biggest communist-run capitalist system. Basically, everyone is a uh, uh, government uh, official or uh, uh, whatever, if they get an order to go to Chad, they have to go to Chad. It doesn't cost very much more to send some, someone to Chad. So consequently, it, Africa's energy potential is already Chinese. That was before 2010. Uh, major investments elsewhere and so on. After 2010, and particularly this uh, uh, silk route, China is doing something else here. It's reviving the silk route. What does that mean, actually? 
I mean, there's this romantic idea of silk route and so on and so forth. But the amount of infrastructure and the amount of um, leverage to uh, have other countries improve their infrastructure is huge. First of all, there is 60 billion earmarked, 60, uh, 60 billion uh, earmarked for the infrastructure there. You can use the, uh, a part of it. Now, what is that infrastructure? Silk Route is a uh, re relatively small route that comes there, and of course, you know, the train connections are being, uh, Turkey already made the connection that the train goes uh, across the Caucasus and so on and so forth. That's, uh, but this also involves energy. Everybody was expecting, and the I must say that the uh, Energy Commission in uh, in uh, Brussels is uh, very far behind its uh, analysis of uh, what is really happening. Uh, they were saying, well, the, uh, the Southern Corridor, uh, after Azerbaijan energy, there will be Iranian energy coming via Turkey as an uh, uh, energy supply source uh, to uh, reduce uh, Europe's dependence on, uh, on uh, Russian gas. I don't think any Iranian gas is going to come there. Iranian gas doesn't come there, although uh, they say Iranian gas is coming, because they don't know the origin of that gas. Ir Iran is uh, bartering from Turkmenistan for peanuts, Turkmen gas, which it sells to Turkey at a higher rate than Russia sells to Germany. That's what's happening. Not an ounce of Iranian gas is coming to Turkey. It has never done so. Iranian gas is here. And during the sanctions, we know that this pipeline connection to Pakistan, and China is uh, beyond American sanctions. Very quietly, that uh, pipeline has been completed all the way to Pakistan. Who did that? Of course, China did that. Um, now, there is, what happened to this, huh? uh, there is uh, here, uh, up here, the Himalayas and so on, there's the northern areas of Pakistan, the northern areas of Pakistan, Pakistan has a border with China. Along with that silk route <clears throat> is the long-term prospect of getting Iranian gas across north of Pakistan and also it would not only help uh, pump uh, this gas uh, from the Gulf, there's the thing across from uh, uh, the same uh, area, the, um, <coughs> but also the infrastructure of the Silk Route coming down to the port that China is building. So that Silk Route infrastructure is also a, a connection to China's short uh, sea connection to East Africa. The other thing, when China's, you know, uh, Belt and Road project, we still think about Silk Route uh, idea. Well, this area is needs uh, a bit of time, uh, including China's, uh, if not military, at least uh, a security presence while constructions are going on. But 
In the meantime, the ultimately the big consumer market for China is, of course, Europe. There is very little written about this until at another uh, think tank meeting I listened to, of all people, the director of Hamburg Port Authority. And uh, his topic there at that session was to get the other aspect of One Belt and Road, that railroad goes through this uh, 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 Siberia and then Belarus directly to the port of Hamburg. That is a wonderful shortcut because that is a very stable area as compared to the difficulties of construction here. But if you see the scope of the project and then some notion of uh, Eurasia became clearer to me that actually the liberal order without the rule of law is going to be the locomotive of that is going to be China. Liberal economic order is going to be there, but it will the the rule of law for us is essentially predictability. Predictability goes down in Western European genes, and of course, the United States is an extension of European Enlightenment in its uh, conception of state and, 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 and so on. But it's that medieval idea of um, contracts, personal contracts, rights and obligations, and so on and so forth. That is essentially a search for predictability in uh, the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages in Europe, where there was no state, there was no uh, state around to enforce contracts, so uh, people had to uh, uh, rely on custom and multiple contracts to both uh, secure what they wanted and also to make sure that there was uh, backup security from other partners multiple contracts. Uh, there was nothing of this kind uh, east of West Europe. Here, uh, all China is saying is basically that I, uh, as the ruler of China, the ruling group, uh, uh, ensures security. And here is the collateral of so much money, you can uh, use this. The final thing I want to say here is then how do we look at the future of this in terms of what it means for Europe? Uh, again, my uh, uh, I think I'm on the right track, but uh, this is not. These are not my. These are my working conclusions so far. That we have talked about two major powers here and uh, sort of a, uh, an area where there is a bit of a chaos, but a bit of dependency and a situation in the southern part of this, Tajikistan, uh, southern Uzbekistan and so on, uh, and uh, Xinjiang in, 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 in China, where there is a substantial infiltration by radical Islam, which is equally uh, threatening to Russia and China. China is a much bigger country with a much bigger, it, it can deal with it much easier. Uh, Russia is essentially um, is a country that is uh, much more vulnerable in that regard, and also much more vulnerable in regard to the fact that Russia's population is now right around 140 million. It is uh, uh, in uh, projections in 25 years 
2040 projections that Russia's population will decline even to 130 million. That 130 million is essentially from here all the way there. And 1.3 uh, uh, billion is here. So this essentially that the kind of interdependency is between Moscow and Beijing is a kind of Hobbesian social contract, isn't it, after all? That um, it is not in the interest of China for Moscow to fall into um, a uh, complete uh, vulnerability, situation of vulnerability. But at the same time, Moscow is also dependent on Chinese investments as, for example, in the much shorter term than this, uh, the uh, pipeline projects that are going north-south here, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the project of t uh, power of Siberia uh, uh, pipeline bringing uh, eastern Siberian oil and gas, uh, gas uh, particularly, and of course this uh, uh, pipeline bringing uh, gas also from here. Uh, if it were not for China, neither the pipelines would be built nor would that gas be extracted. But equally, uh, Russia is, and also Kazakhstan, extremely worried that this empty prairie will be all of a sudden filled with Chinese because they need room to expand. Uh, yet it is a Hobbesian social contract because uh, China is the only one that can guarantee the lifeline and increased uh, income from resources uh, to the Russians. What it means for Europe is the following. All right, look at this. Uh, uh, very simple, uh, being also uh, and an American myself, uh, <laughs> regretting the isolationism that is descending like a nightmare on the United States, that we have to uh, look at this as a, an opportunity for Europe. Uh, because all this investment is being directed towards the European Consumer Plus and actually China is not an immediate neighbor. China is uh, an economic and production potential that is also a very big market itself for other things. Um, and uh, this offers a unique opportunity uh, for uh, Europe to take advantage of a, an economic center of gravity that moved from mid-Atlantic, essentially, to around this area. So I am, and on that, uh, in that respect, I am optimistic. What I am not confident about is where is the leadership to change these complicated gears in Europe. I am very skeptical that those gears can be changed in Brussels. They will have to be changed in Berlin uh, or Franco-Alemont. Thank you.